On August 9th of 2005, a couple by the names of Jennifer and George Hyatt attempted a Bonnie and Clyde style escape from a courthouse following George's conviction for robbery. But in their path, they led a dark trail of blood and tears. This is the case of the Kingston Courthouse shooting. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also slipping in grocery stores. Oops, definitely didn't do that on purpose to get a lot of money. Anyway, today we're going over the case of the Kingston Courthouse shooting. You're going to learn about how inner turmoil combined with selfish, lustful desire can turn deadly. For our story, we're heading to Roan County, Tennessee. Roan County has a population of around 50,000 people. It's generally a pretty safe place to live and has a lot of beautiful natural scenery. Additionally, it's the childhood home of famous celebrity Megan Fox and served as the filming location for some well-known movies such as October Sky. But if you ever happen to find yourself here, there's no shortage of fun things to do. You can visit the Kingston City Park featuring two playgrounds, picnic tables, boat ramps, and sand volleyball. You could head over to Bald River Falls, a scenic 90-foot waterfall perfect for taking pictures with friends. You could stop by the K-25 History Museum, a place that served a crucial role during the ultra-secret Manhattan Project. You could even visit the Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary, which is, spoiler alert, actually one of the places in our story today and also where Silence of the Lambs was filmed. But despite how fun meeting Hannibal Lecter in person sounds, none of these things I just listed are the reason as to why we're in Roan County today. Jennifer Hyatt and her husband George wanted to be the modern day Bonnie and Clyde, so much so that when all was set and done and their reign of terror was over, Jennifer sat down in her jail cell to begin writing a memoir that she titled A Modern Day Bonnie and Clyde. And while she never finished it because of her conviction for murder, she did provide the public with a decent amount of info. Jennifer Forsyth Hyatt was born on February 11th of 1974 in Emory County, Utah. Growing up, she experienced a lot of issues when it came to her family. Her earliest memory was attending her parents' divorce hearing as a young child. And sometime after that, her father got remarried, but neither her nor any of her siblings were invited to the wedding. And soon, one of the new additions to Jennifer's father's side of the family actually begins violating her. Evidently, this went on for four years, and this was something Jennifer kept hidden from the public. But even so, she found a distraction in her childhood interests. Now, one of the interests that was very important to her was horses. Jennifer's aunt owned many horses and frequently allowed her to interact with them. To Jennifer, these animals represented a type of freedom and escape from her problems. One of the horses was a thoroughbred named Weaver. According to Jennifer, she became practically obsessed with Weaver and began confiding in him all of her darkest, deepest secrets. However, one day when Jennifer went to go visit the barn, she was informed by her aunt that Weaver had been sold. After this, she gradually became less interested in horses and more interested in other things, such as alcohol, and older men. By the time Jennifer turned 15, she was dating a 25-year-old man and partying on a weekly basis. Late at night, she would sneak out of her parents' house and party, and on one occasion, she unintentionally stopped a raid. 
Now, exactly how that happened went as follows. So, like many children of divorced parents, Jennifer went back and forth between her mother's and her father's houses. During a night that she was at her father's house, she snuck out and stole his truck. Well, as it turns out, Jennifer's father was a police deputy, and the house she went to party at was supposed to be raided by the police. And so when the police department went to go raid this house, they saw Jennifer's father's truck parked outside. They figured he already had it covered, and so they chose not to do so. Interesting. Anyway, this habit of poor decisions continued throughout the rest of Jennifer's early teen years and into early adulthood. Just a few years later, shortly before she began her senior year of high school, she fell in love with a man who soon became her husband. The man's name was Eli, and the night before the pair got married, Jennifer caught him curled up in bed with another woman. Right away, Eli gave the 18-year-old Jennifer a flimsy excuse for why he was in bed with her, and Jennifer accepted it. Then the day after, the two of them followed through with the ceremony. And by the way, as all of this was happening, Jennifer was three months pregnant. Now, unsurprisingly, this marriage ended up being a total disaster. Repeatedly, the couple got into heated arguments and used illegal substances and alcohol. Despite this, they ended up having three children together, two boys and one girl. And by 1996, Jennifer claims to have tried snow for the first time. Before long, this drug use became habitual, and Jennifer and Eli did whatever they could to get their hands on their various substances. It had gotten to the point that whenever they didn't have enough money, Jennifer was quote-unquote sold off in order to obtain money for these substances. In other words, she was selling her body in exchange for money. Jennifer claims to have ultimately quit using snow after a six-month binge, where she returned home and her children practically didn't recognize her anymore. Then, in 1999, her husband Eli was sent to prison for building a meth lab in the basement of their three-bedroom home. So after that, Jennifer divorced Eli and married a new guy. But this new guy was apparently too much of a pushover, so she started cheating on him with a man named Travis. Ironically, Jennifer had been introduced to Travis at her own wedding with her second husband. Apparently, she was drawn to him instantly, and soon the two were engaging in an affair. Before long, Jennifer's husband figured out about this affair, but like she claimed, he was a pushover. So once he discovered it, Jennifer kicked him out, and Travis moved in. Unsurprisingly, though, Jennifer had a lot of issues with Travis, too, and ended up cheating on him with his best friend. So that relationship was basically dead in the water almost as fast as it started. Regardless, by the year 2001, Jennifer was ready for the next chapter of her life. One of her friends named Tina, who lived in Nashville, Tennessee, repeatedly kept trying to get her to visit. Then, in mid-2001, she finally did, and as it turns out, she fell in love with the place. So when September rolled around, Jennifer packed her bags, took the kids, and moved out there permanently. But what Tennessee had to offer would end up being a lot more evil than anyone ever could have guessed. So the time period was now the early 2000s. Shortly after moving to Tennessee, Jennifer started working on becoming a nurse. Then, following a few years of schooling, she finally received her diploma in 2004. Afterwards, she began working at a state correctional facility known as Northwest Correctional Complex. Here, she was supposed to provide inmates with care and hospitality, but for one particular inmate, she would end up providing a lot more than just that. 
According to Jennifer, the moment she encountered 33-year-old prisoner George Hyatt, she fell in love with him at first sight. Now George was a criminal with a long rap sheet going back at least a decade. Many of the crimes he committed were quite violent and included things such as aggravated assault and robbery. By the time he and Jennifer met, he had already escaped from jail multiple times and was now serving a 35-year-long sentence. However, being the smooth-talking ladies' man he was, George soon managed to get Jennifer to look past his background and ignore all of that. Within a matter of months, Jennifer was absolutely infatuated with George. And only five months after meeting him, she was fired from her job for sneaking in food for him to eat. After that, George was transferred to Riverbend Maximum Security Prison in Nashville. But even here, he and Jennifer continued to keep in contact through a cell phone smuggled into the prison. By the spring of 2005, Jennifer requested permission from the warden to marry George, and he agreed. The only condition was that the two of them were required to attend a marriage counseling session in the presence of a minister. And so, that's exactly what they did. They attended a session, and Jennifer finally got to learn about all of the terrible crimes that George had committed. Apparently, before this, she had no idea the extent of his rap sheet. Sure, she knew he had done some bad things, but exactly how bad, she never realized. So once Jennifer learned, it took her a bit to take it all in, and the wedding was postponed for about a month. But she quickly got over her cold feet, and on May 20th of 2005, her and George were officially married. Now, one thing it is important to point out about the wedding is that it wasn't done in the traditional way. Because George was what's known as a close custody inmate, he technically wasn't allowed visitors, and he certainly wasn't allowed to have any close physical contact. So naturally, all of this interaction was done under close supervision by prison guards. And despite the fact that they were now legally married, George still wasn't allowed visitors. But anyway, before long, George was once again transferred to another maximum security prison. This time, it was a place called Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. Brushy Mountain has since been closed down and turned into a tourist attraction. But in 2005, it was still up and running. Here, Jennifer and George continued keeping in contact through contraband methods. But two months after getting married, the couple got into a terrible argument. It was apparently so bad that Jennifer attempted to take her own life, claiming that she couldn't live without George. Luckily for her, she failed this attempt. But because the separation was becoming increasingly unbearable for her, Jennifer began coming up with plans to break George out of prison. Together with her new husband, she plotted and schemed, and before long, a clear plan maternalized. Soon the couple learned George had a court hearing coming up on August 9th for a robbery charge. So for George and Jennifer, this seemed like the perfect date and location for George's escape. A month or so before the hearing, Jennifer began getting her ducks in a row. First, she bought a 9mm handgun. Then, she made plans to steal a getaway vehicle. And finally, she withdrew a decent amount of money from her bank account. On top of all of this, she asked her father if she could borrow a set of handcuff keys. Now, if you remember, Jennifer's father was a police deputy earlier in his life. So when she asked him about handcuff keys, he was immediately suspicious. Right after speaking with his daughter, he contacted the police in Utah, attempting to get them to alert the authorities in Tennessee. 
However, this warning went unheeded, and they never contacted them. Apparently, the spouse of a criminal asking for handcuff keys didn't raise any red flags. Anyway, Jennifer never ended up being able to acquire any keys, but by mid-July, the rest of her arrangements were in order. She had successfully gotten a new job, working as a home care nurse and sent her children back to Utah to live with their father, Eli. Now the only thing left to do was to wait around until the hearing took place. But in no time, weeks had passed, and it was now August 9th of 2005, the day of the plan. So shortly before 10 a.m., prisoner George Hyatt was transferred from Brushy Mountain Penitentiary to the Roan County Courthouse in Kingston, Tennessee. This was done via transport vehicle, and George was put in handcuffs and shackled at the feet. The officers responsible for escorting George were Larry Porky Harris and Wayne Cotton Morgan. Wayne Thomas Cotton Morgan was one of the best corrections officers Brushy Mountain ever had. Born on Halloween Day, 1948, Morgan was given the nickname Cotton because his hair was white as a child before later turning brown as an adult. In the late 60s, he served in the Vietnam War and received several accolades, including a Purple Heart. Morgan was a father, a husband, a Christian, and someone who everybody loved and respected. He treated the inmates at Brushy Mountain as humanely as he possibly could, and he even held a jail ministry at a local jail every Thursday evening. But because of two people's selfishness and cruelty, something terrible was about to happen to him. So following their transporting of George to the Roan County Courthouse, Morgan and Harris unloaded George from the vehicle and escorted him into the building. For the most part, the inside of the courthouse was practically empty. The only people inside were the judge, the bailiff, the staff, and a woman sitting in the front row by the name of Jennifer Hyatt. Remember her? Anyway, after George was escorted in, the court proceedings took place, and within the hour, he was convicted of robbery and given a six-year sentence. Following the reading of the sentence, George became emotional, and Officer Morgan consoled him. Around the same time as this, George looked over at Jennifer and nodded, and taking this as her signal to initiate the plan, Jennifer then got up and left the building. Next, Officers Morgan and Harris escorted George outside, but as they were loading him into the transport van, he started becoming belligerent and refused to enter. This was evidently part of the plan. Meanwhile, though, Something insane was about to happen. Jennifer, who had left the courthouse a couple minutes before, pulled up next to the van in a Ford Explorer SUV. Quickly, she then got out, walked up near the rear of the van, and aimed her gun at the two officers escorting George. Then George looked over and saw her and shouted, Shoot him! Referring, of course, to Officer Morgan. So as Officer Morgan glanced over and cried out, No! Jennifer shot him directly in the abdomen. Afterwards, she and Officer Harris got into a shootout, leading to both of them experiencing injuries. But ultimately, Jennifer and George managed to escape in Jennifer's SUV. Meanwhile, Officer George was flown to the hospital for emergency medical treatment. Now, strangely enough, he and Officer Harris were actually supposed to be wearing bulletproof vests. But, on that particular day, they chose not to wear them. Anyway, now on the run, Jennifer and George drove about a half mile away to a nearby sandwich shop. Here, they ditched the SUV and had gotten into a minivan Jennifer had stolen the day before. About four hours later, the couple then drove to a Lowe's in Florence, Kentucky. In the Lowe's, Jennifer bought a hacksaw to cut off George's shackles. 
Then, when she returned to the minivan, that's exactly what she did. At this point, George's limbs were now completely free. Additionally, Jennifer had bought George a change of clothes and threw his jumpsuit in a nearby dumpster. Afterwards, the couple drove a half mile away to a motel and rented a room for a night. Sometime during the night, Jennifer dyed her hair black from its original light brown color. The following morning, the couple then abandoned the minivan and took a $185 taxi to Columbus, Ohio. While still in the cab, the cab driver found the couple to be very suspicious. Evidently, when they got in, they gave him $200 bills and told him they were going to an Amway convention. However, the cab driver said that they didn't act like Amway representatives. And additionally, he found it strange that Jennifer was favoring one leg over the other. When he asked her about it, she claimed to have been in a bad car accident. But the real reason why was because she had been shot in the leg. Regardless, the cab driver ended up dropping them off at an America's Best Value Inn, and for the time being, that was that. Once they got checked in, Jennifer and George ordered Mexican food and smoked some cigarettes. Meanwhile, though, once the taxi driver got home later, it finally dawned on him who those strange passengers actually were. Now by then, Jennifer and George's names and faces were being plastered all over the TV and radio. So the moment the cabbie put two and two together, he contacted the authorities and gave them all of the information he had. Soon after that, police also discovered the couple's abandoned minivan. And so now, with this combination of leads, they were ready to pounce. Before long, a task force including U.S. Marshals and SWAT team members paid the hotel Jennifer and George were staying at a little visit. When they got there, one of the officers called the hotel room the couple was in in order to negotiate their surrender. By now, Jennifer and George were exhausted and didn't see any point in resisting. So they agreed to surrender and gave up without a fight. All that destruction and mayhem for nothing. And what destruction had they caused? Well, one man, Officer Harris, was terribly injured but still alive. And another, Officer Morgan, was now officially dead. He had died shortly after being airlifted to the hospital. The humble, church-going Officer Morgan was 56 years old with two young grandchildren. On top of the destruction of a human life, a van was stolen from a sick person, and Jennifer's three kids were going to be without a mother for the rest of their lives. But after her and her husband were arrested, Jennifer was soon taken to a nearby hospital to be treated for her wounds. After being treated for a few days, she was then taken to an Ohio jail. Meanwhile, George was returned to prison and placed under heavy supervision. But in Jennifer's jail cell, she not only wrote a biographical manuscript, but also a series of letters. And in several of these letters, she made some pretty sickening remarks. First of all, she was apparently highly amused at the idea that her and George were being branded an outlaw couple. Many of the letters she even signed Bonnie at the bottom, as in Bonnie and Clyde, of course. But even worse than that, she claimed that she didn't regret what she did. In fact, she adored the attention and said that breaking George out of prison was the best two days of her entire life. But later on, when her pre-trial took place, her tone was a bit different. During one part, she cried and did claim to regret her actions. Soon, Officer Morgan's son Dennis then took the stand and his words were heartbreaking. Your choices caused my sister and I to be without a father, he said to Jennifer. Your choices caused my mom to be without her companion. In the end, Jennifer and George Hyatt were both given life sentences for what they did. But like many of you all know too well, nothing can take back the pain 
caused by the loss of a loved one. Officer Morgan was a kind-hearted Christian man who didn't deserve what happened to him. It's very disheartening how often random people end up being the victims of cruel and senseless violence. Rest in peace to Wayne Cotton Morgan. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. Recently, I've started an all-exclusive Patreon. Here, you're given the choice of three tiers, and the last one allows for a Patreon-only video that's uncensored. That tier and the second tier will allow you to have your name at the end of each High Time Crime video. That's in case you want to support me a little further. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.